Oh, that, I guess there's just another little lesson. Every one of us is imperfect, right? <laughs> all, all of us have some things that God may want to change and cleanse in us. And some of us may think that we've taken care of everything. And we haven't. <laughs> now, that was your warning. If your phone goes off, you just be embarrassed because... I got the chance to be embarrassed, so now if you let yours go off after I already got caught, uh, we're all going to just look. <laughs> and I just uh, thought it would be appropriate for us. Uh, I understand that you, some of you were talking last week during the message. I just think that's really kind of rude that some of you, while Tyler was up here, were talking. I actually hear that somebody sitting in the back said, I like this kid. <laughs> just, just, you know, watch out the, for the conversation because other people are hearing what you say while the message is going on. So uh, I'm sure you didn't applaud him last week, but we, why don't we just say uh, some kind of thank you to Tyler uh, for getting... <laughs> You're blushing. I hadn't noticed that. Never saw that. I noticed you did that. Okay. <laughs> okay. By the way, um, I'm going to pull one on you. Right. Yeah, I'm going to pull one on you. Uh, so testing one, two, three, four. There you go. Um, you, you, Tyler, yeah, come on up here. Um, um, you and Kylie were really um, pretty active yesterday. Yes. Yeah, running around. Uh, I saw you at the coffee shop up here. Uh, but what were you guys doing? Um, so yesterday we were out and about handing out flyers and trying to promote our youth group. Um, and just speaking, more than that though, um, that was kind of the, the indirect thing, but a lot of it was really just trying to talk about Jesus with people and share our faith and, and uh, just continue to spread the gospel, really. Uh, that, now that's what you should applaud. Okay. <laughs> More than trying to just build a youth group is trying to just go minister, go share Jesus. And um, I just want to thank you for doing that, and you're an example for the rest of us. Yes, and Kylie, thank you so much for doing that. And both of you had some fun, I take it? Yes, a and lot so, of fun, actually. Yeah. Do <laughs> you want to share, like, any one little tidbit? Only one. Oh, man. Um, you, I'm sure you got beat up, tarred and feathered, <laughs> hollered and screamed at. I mean, didn't people like, you know, ah, those Christians, yeah, yeah. That, that's what we were expecting. Oh, yeah? I'd be surprised. A lot of people actually received us pretty well with uh, kindness and, and No way. Sometimes. Yeah. They received you? Yeah, yeah. Oh, my it's, goodness. So you didn't have to shake the dust us. off your foot or anything no, like no, that. No, All no. right. <laughs> we, we actually had to let go of our food. We're like, oh, my gosh, the people actually might want to hear about it. Oh, no. People want to hear about Jesus. Shucks, and I was afraid to share. <laughs> yeah, pretty much. Mm, okay, good. <laughs> so was there one you wanted to share? One, one tidbit? Oh, there was this one cool moment. Um, there was a young fellow that... Um, Let's keep you away from that speaker just in yeah. case. There was a young guy. Um, his name was Chase. And, you know, we, we went and we saw him earlier, and his family was really cool um, with having us talk to them. And, and um, and ultimately having inviting them and, and, and discussing Jesus with them and uh, we walked around. Nothing much happened the first time, but later on we saw him just sitting by himself on his phone. And so we stopped by and hung out with him for a little bit. And um, we were just having a, a very casual conversation at first, but then uh, he eventually asked what my wristband meant. And um, y'all might see this. It, it's the four points of the gospel. It's like the most simple way you can tell the gospel to someone. And um, he asked, hey, what, what's, what does your wristband mean? And uh, yeah, and so we went and I, I told him the gospel. And at the end, you know, it's like you, you get to decide if you want that love. And he said it. So like, does this, is that something you want? And he was like, no, no. And, uh, but, but we still, we, we hung out with him. And we, and we started discussing God and, and, and how he is in the world and, and how he's affected us. From that point, we just started to get to testify how um, we've experienced his love through Jesus. And, um, you know, we, we ultimately, yeah, we, we didn't get to um, give him Christ that day, but uh, we still made an awesome connection and an awesome friendship. And, um, and ultimately, it's something that he knows what we're about now. And uh, he still um, 
wants that, that, that relationship ultimately. And so there's, there's a, a real foundation that we can start to build a true relationship leading to leading him to Christ ultimately. So for the moment, it sounds like one would say, well, Chase rejected Christ, but I would say he hasn't. No. And I would also say that too often our fear is, is that we are going to be rejected. And the bottom line that if somebody does reject Jesus Christ, so what if they reject you? And there's too much fear holding us back from sharing the love of Jesus with the people around us. So thank you for doing that and for proving yourself wrong that there's nothing to fear. Right, absolutely. Yeah, cool. Thanks, Tyler. <laughs> See, Paul was writing to the Thessalonian church, a church that he barely knew, a church that he'd only spent a few weeks with, and he's talking to them about being sanctified. Do you all know what it means to be sanctified? It means take a bath, okay? It means get cleaned up. And it means get cleaned up by Jesus Christ. And it means actually living a different way. To get sanctified means you're actually going to look different, like some of you do today, right? You, you hopefully look different than you did yesterday. You, you got cleaned up. You prepared yourself. But we don't want to just do this on the outside. This is something that we want God to do for us on the inside, to cleanse us. Hmm. I was starting a conversation with somebody. We're having a lot of interruptions this morning. I'm going to have to pray again. Father God, I do pray that, Lord, you would just keep our hearts and our minds open and focused on you. Holy Spirit, don't allow any distraction in our own life or even in the room to keep us from listening to you and hearing you. I even pray, God, that I won't be a distraction to somebody hearing the word that you want them to receive. And I pray, God, that as we, as we come to this text today, Lord, it, there's some things about this text that, frankly, I confess are tough. There's some hard words here for us. And I pray, Lord, that I will be open to what you are saying and that we as a congregation, as a church, as a people, as each guest, as each individual, that we'll be open to what you want to say to us. And may our blinders or our prejudice not hinder us from hearing from you. In Jesus' name, amen. So Paul writes in the fourth chapter, he finally gets to the stuff he wants them to work on. He's been saying, you know, I'm concerned about you. I'm afraid you might uh, have, have already left the faith. Uh, you were so new. You've been persecuted really bad. Some of you have been locked up. You've been beaten with rods. And you only accepted Christ three weeks after three weeks. In fact, there's only been three months earlier, probably maybe a little more than a little more than maybe more maybe have you still believers. Did any of you go beyond that first step? And he's and look at this. Most of you here, if you're a Christian, have been a Christian for a lot longer than three weeks, right? First yeah. Thessalonians four, he says, Let's let's get into the stuff that matters. As as for other matters, brothers and sisters, we instructed you how to live in order to please God as in fact you are living. Now we ask you and urge you in the Lord Jesus to do this more and more. For you know what instructions we gave you by the authority of the Lord Jesus. It is God's will that you should be sanctified, that you should avoid sexual immorality, that each of you should learn to control your own body in a way that is holy and honorable, not in passionate lust like the pagans who do not know God. And that in this matter, no one should wrong or take advantage of a brother or sister. The Lord will punish all those who commit such sins, as we told you and warned you before. For God did not call us to be impure, but to live a holy life. Therefore, anyone who rejects this instruction does not reject a human being, but God, the very God who gives you his Holy Spirit. We're in our series right now on evaluations, and we're trying to evaluate our church as, a, as well as us individually. We want to say, God, how, we want you to look at us. Examine us, Lord. And really, frankly, I'm hoping you're praying this kind of a prayer. God, show us if there's any sin in us, anything at all. And, and I would encourage you, pray that on a weekly, daily kind of a basis. Because here's the fact. Every single person in this room, starting with the person standing on the platform to the person seated behind the, the, the sound system back there, every person here sins. 
And what's really sad is most of us do it deliberately. We know we're doing it. And it may be as, quote, as simple as we just drove a little too fast. Or as bad as we've blatantly gone against God's will. And that might mean we've been abusive, we've lied, we've sworn, we've mistreated somebody. Um, our sins are many. We've gotten angry, we've argued, we've fought, we've been impatient. Or here's one, and it's one of the big ones in the body of Christ, we've gossiped. We've talked about somebody else. We've been negative, we've been critical, we've been harsh, we've been judgmental. And, all kinds of ways we've given into habits, we've given into our addictions, whatever they might be, our addiction to food, our addiction to alcohol, our addiction to drugs, our addiction to speed, our addiction to behaviors, our addiction to money, our addiction to shopping, our addiction to Starbucks, whatever, okay? <laughs> Shoe fits weird, all I can say. <laughs> You're the only one who groaned <laughs> with that whole list. <laughs> so we're evaluating ourselves and we're praying. And here we need to be asking the Spirit of God to, be, to evaluate us. And seriously to convict us of thins, sins because we do have blinders. So my question that I start out the message with today is, have you learned how to live in a way that pleases God? Have you personally learned how to live in a way that pleases God? Th this whole sermon is about pleasing God. And have you learned the things that God wants you to do that will please Him? Do you even care about whether you please God or not? And I guess the, the real question there is, if you really care, are you walking like Jesus walked? Because that was, that's what it means to please God. That's what it means to be sanctified. That's what it means to be holy. It means to be living like Jesus lived. 1 John chapter 2 says, My dear children, I write this to you so that you will not sin. But if anyone does sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous one. He is the atoning sacrifice for our sins, and not only for ours, but also for the sins of the whole world. We know that we have come to know him if we keep his commands. Whoever says, I know him, but does not do what he commands is a liar, and the truth is not in that person. Whoa. I'm going to warn you there's going to be some tough words this morning. I give you that warning because some of you may want to say, okay, good, I'm going to check out. I'm, just, I'm not going to listen to you today, Bill. Just, you know, I'll just kind of uh, daydreaming with some other stuff. Because here's the thing, if you listen and you hear some of the things that God's wanting you to hear and you do nothing about it, you're worse off than when you came in. Do you hear my warning? It's important that we do something about what God says to us. Whoever says, I know him, but does not do what he commands is a liar and the truth is not in that person. But if anyone obeys his word, love for God is truly made complete in them. And this is how we know we are in him. Whoever claims to live in him, look at the example, must live as Jesus did. You are to walk like Christ. Do you want to please God? Then live like Jesus did. Walk like he walked. Do what he did. J. Vernon McGee explains walking this way. He says, walking is not a balloon ascension. You know, just floating upwards. It's a great many people think the Christian life is some great overwhelming experience and you take off like a rocket going out into space. That's not where you live the Christian life. Rather, it is in your home, in your office, in the schoolroom, on the street. The way you get around in this life is to walk. You are to walk in Christ. Stedman says walking involves two st simple steps. Walk this way through life, put off the old man, and put on the new. Those are the two simple steps. Put off the old and put on the new. Get rid of what's bad and start the new life. 
Colossians says it this way, put to death, therefore, whatever belongs to your earthly nature. And then listen to this list. Sexual immorality, impurity, lust, evil desires, and greed, which is idolatry. Because of these, the wrath of God is coming. You used to walk in these ways in the life you once lived, but now you must also rid yourselves of all such things as these. Oh, he's got more. This list gets longer. Has anyone gotten angry lately? Mm, just some groans, but no, no confessions here this morning. Mm -hmm. Okay. Fortunately, you didn't rage, though, right? No. Oh, phew. So, so you only got one bad one. Malice, you thought bad of somebody else. Anyone think bad of somebody else? Spouse, neighbor, friend, the driver in front of you who's going too slow, <laughs> even though they were going the speed limit. <laughs> Slander. You said something about someone else, and they weren't there. And maybe it wasn't totally accurate. Uh, anybody cuss lately? Throw out an F-bomb, uh, uh, go to H-E double hockey sticks, or you know, something else like that. You must rid yourselves of all such things as these, anger, rage, malice, slander, and filthy language from your lips. Anybody exaggerate? Anyone exaggerate a story this week? Only two. We got a lot not confessing. Okay, now we're getting more honest. Okay. Exaggerate. Guess what? That's lying. Okay. Do not lie to each other since you have taken off your old self with its practices and put on the new self, which is being renewed in knowledge in the image of its creator. My question, are you living to please God? Are you living your life so that God will look at you and be pleased. <clears throat> you know, remember, some of you will know this, um, some of you are way too young for this one, but that there's a guy named Ricky Nelson. Ricky Nelson sang a song, and the, and the song said, yeah, it's all right now, I learned my lesson well. You see, you can't please everyone, so you gotta please yourself. Are you living to please yourself or are you living to please God? Ricky wrote that, by the way, that song because he got booed out of the gardens in New, in New York City. Booed out. So he comes back and he, write, and he sings this song and the song is all about him getting booed out of there. And they give him a standing ovation. People are a feel cool, okay? <laughs> Because, and, and, and even his song says, you know, he, he was trying to do all his old music. And they blew him because he's doing all his old music. So he comes back, does this new song, which is all about them, and they, and they, and they standing ovation. Are you living for yourself or are you living to please God? I didn't say, are you living to please other people? Are you living for yourself or are you living to please God? Romans says in th chapter 15, we who are strong ought to bear with the failings of the weak and not to please ourselves. Each of us should please our neighbors for their good to build them up. For even Christ did not please himself, but as it is written, the insults of those who insult you have fallen on me. That means Jesus takes the insults that, that are meant for us. For everything that was written in the past was written to teach us so that through the endurance taught in the scriptures and the encouragement they provide, we might have hope. May the God who gives endurance and encouragement give you the same attitude of mind toward each other that Christ Jesus had so that with one mind and one voice you may glorify the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. When you love somebody, don't you want to please them? Think about it. Some of you have some people here who just made new commitments of love, right? When you love somebody, isn't it a desire of yours to somehow make them happy? Do something good for them? Bless them in some way? Because you love, we want to please them. If you aren't pleasing them, if you're getting angry, if you're getting ticked off at them, is that going to please them? 
If you love Jesus, you're going to want to do the things that please Jesus, aren't you? Do you want to please God? In our text, Paul says, now we ask you and urge you in the Lord Jesus to do this more and more, to live in a way that pleases God more and more than you've already been doing. Philippians says it this way, and this is my prayer, that your love may abound more and more in knowledge and depth of insight so that you may be able to discern what is best and may be pure and blameless for the day of Christ, filled with the fruit of righteousness that comes through Jesus Christ to the glory and praise of God. 2 Corinthians says, and God is able to bless you abundantly. More and more is the, is the word there. So that in all things, at all times, having all that you need, you abound in every good work. God wants to help you to please the people that you love. And most of all, to please him. Now he goes into the text, and this is where it starts to get a little bit like, uh-oh. Very short, very, very pointed statement. Be sanctified. How? What does he say? Avoid sexual immorality. Sanctification involves a couple steps. Ceasing to do what's wrong and learning to do what's right. That's all part of sanctification. 1 Corinthians says, flee from sexual immorality. All other sins a person commits are outside the body, but whoever sins sexually sins against their own body. Do you not know that your bodies are temples of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have received from God? You are not your own. You were bought at a price. Therefore, honor God with your bodies. We live in a very sexually crazed culture. Most of us don't even realize how, how much we are having filters that we're watching that are, that are affecting our very thinking. Find any magazine, watch almost any commercial, and you'll see that there's some sexual aspect of it, that they're trying to use sex to somehow promote their, their uh, product to you. Um, John MacArthur said, it should be patently obvious to all of us that we live in a sex-mad culture, that we live in a culture that is indulging itself in every conceivable and inconceivable sexual activity. In fact, it probably would tax your imagination and mine beyond its ability to conceive of a more sexually perverted or immoral society than the one in which we live. Not only is sexual sin tolerated in any form by anyone, with anyone else, anytime, any place, in any way, but more than just being tolerated, it's advocated, promoted, marketed through every meeting, media means possible. Paul's writing to a very sex-crazed culture, the Thessalonians. They live in a place where there are temple prostitutes. What's a temple prostitute? That's somebody you go have sex with so you can get closer to God, the God that they were worshiping. They had children who were being used, little boys who were being used for sex. Uh, the, the, the culture was, was um, uh, terrible. You would buy a concubine and keep concubines around because you didn't have sex with your wife, you had sex with the concubines. You would pay prostitutes. Prostitution was a huge, huge industry. The, the, the sexual culture of Thessalonica was terrible. On th top it off, they're on the coast, so there's all kinds of people coming in and out, kind of like in Bangkok today, the red light district of Bangkok, and where, and where the, which it's, sex is freely offered. Well, not really freely. Not only is, does it cost you money, but it's going to cost you something else. We live in a very sexually crazed culture. MacArthur goes on to quote Hugh Hefner. Incidentally, um, John, John made a point of saying he, he read this quote in a, in a quote from a Christian author. He did not read Playboy to get this quote. But Hugh Hefner said, Sex is a function of the body, a drive which man shares with animals like eating, drinking, and sleeping. You're an animal, that's why you do what you do. It is a physical demand, that was my quote, sorry. It, it is a physical demand that must be satisfied. If you don't satisfy it, you will have all sorts of neuroses and repression psychoses. Sex is here to stay. Let's forget the prudery that makes us hide from it. Throw away those inhibitions. Find a girl who is like-minded and let yourself go. End of quote. And what does Paul say? 
The Word of God says, control your body in a way that is holy and honorable. See, Christianity laid down a whole new code of ethics when Jesus Christ came. And Christianity, in fact, Barclay says, is the champion of purity and the guardian of the home. This cannot be affirmed too plainly in our own day, which again has seen a pronounced shift in standards of sexual behavior. Think about some of these texts. By the way, the, the, the text here says when we're supposed to control our own body, the word that's used there is vessel. And there are some discussions, you know, somebody has said, well, that means to control your vessel meant control your wife. Okay, so that meant girls, you didn't have to do any control. It was just about the guys controlling their wives. But, but I, I, I'm sorry, I do not think that's what the, the, the focus of this text means. Control your vessel means control your vessel which holds the Holy Spirit. You are a vessel containing Jesus Christ, the Spirit of God within you, and you are supposed to control this vessel. Every single one of you, boy, girl, man, woman, every single one of us is supposed to control our vessel. Don't use someone else, he goes on to say, for your own gratification. Romans 6.12, don't let sin reign, but present your bodies to God. Galatians 5.6, walk by the Spirit, you won't gratify the flesh. Be smart enough to avoid those kinds of people, those kinds of places, those kinds of experiences, which can culminate in sexual sin. Galatians 5.24, those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. And could I just say, for those of you who have no issues with sex, okay, you're not tempted, no, no temptation with porn, um, none of you guys are red-blooded, right? So all of you are holy saints, and I understand that. But there's some people who do have issues with all kinds of things like all, pornography, viewing things on the Internet. It's rampant today. Um, young people are seeing so much stuff that you you couldn't have gotten. Some of you couldn't have gotten when you were a young per, when you were even an adult. As, as 21, you couldn't have gotten some of this sexual stuff that's out there. But I need to say something here at this moment too. That when he's talking about sex, there's a lot more perversions that we get involved in, aren't there? There are a lot more things that we do to our body that's not just about sex, is it? There's all kinds of ways that we can give in to passions and give in to things, give in to, frankly, addictions that are harmful to us. Those who belong to Christ have crucified the flesh with its passions and its desires. And by the way, what does God require of us in our sexual behavior? God's will is that you would be spirit-controlled, that the Holy Spirit would control your passions and what you do with your body. God wants you to be saved, doesn't he? And God wants that us all to be set apart from sin. God doesn't want us sinning, does he? So how can I conduct my physical relationships so I am holy? And by the way, what does it mean to be holy? None of us feel very holy, do we? Because we kind of think in holy as being perfect, uh, being totally like God, and, and we want to be, but we're not. But to be holy means to be set apart. We have been set apart for God's purposes. We want to become more like him. And so what does he say? Avoid sexual immorality. Stedman writes this. He says, so Paul says, we're to learn how to control our bodies in holiness. That means wholeness and honor. Control contributes to that sense of wholeness. You're in charge of your own body. You're not bound to it. You're not a slave to it. In the text, Paul goes on to say, and don't take advantage of another. Don't take advantage of a brother or a sister. And I appreciate the fact that he said it's both. Because in, in today, just as many girls are taking advantage of guys as guys are taking advantage of girls at, at various ages. Men and women, all, it, it's all across the board. It doesn't matter what your age. Just don't take advantage. Adam Clark even said, the Greek is so gentle that it may prohibit all kinds of fraud, overreaching, or covetousness, and may refer to any attempts to deprive another of his rights. Anything we do that's going to keep somebody else. By the way, what's it say? What did we say recently on the college campus? No means no. And there's been that whole campaign, no means no. And why should we even have to have such a campaign? Except that people have been taking advantage of one another in multiple different kinds of ways. And so now you have to say, I meant no, no didn't mean that I was trying to say yes to you and get you excited. No meant no. And we're doing things on the college campus and it's terrible what's happening to kids out there. John Piper warns us. 
He says, when we sin sexually, we're not seeking the highest good of others. Not the woman or the man we sin, we sin with, nor the person we fantasize about, nor the person in the pornography, nor the spouse or parent or any of these. It's not Christian love that moves us any of this. It's simply selfish desire. But Christians are deeply moved by love for others. Christians love people. They don't, they don't use them. And let's face it, any part of porn is using someone else. Any use of it. And now we get to the toughest part of this text. Because Paul says something that most of us are not going to like. And he says, the Lord will punish you. The Lord will punish all those who commit such sins as we told you and warned you before. The Lord is going to punish you for your sin. God wants us to live a holy life. But when we sin, especially when we sin sexually, we are rejecting God. We're rejecting the Holy Spirit who is already living in us. And again, I need to point out, any sin is doing that. Paul's making emphasis here of sexual sin because it's so rampant in their culture. Well, I guess it's rampant in ours too. But he's, there's all kinds of sin that is harmful to us that we continue to do. And Paul say, no, look, live a holy life. Because when you, when you are sinning and you're habitually doing it, you're doing something and you, and, you, and you even know it's a sin, but you've kind of just said, oh, it's okay, it doesn't really matter, that when you do that, you're actually rejecting God personally. And you're even saying to the Holy Spirit who's dwelling within you. I don't care, Holy Spirit. I don't care if you don't, you don't like being here. This is what I'm going to do. Amen. And now I want to preach John Piper's sermons for a few moments. John Piper says that the consequences of lust are going to be worse than the consequences of nuclear war. All that nuclear war can do is kill the body. Jesus said, do not fear those who kill the body and after that have no more that, that they can do. But I will warn you whom to fear. Fear him who after he has killed has power to cast into hell. Who has the power to cast into hell? Only God. In other words, God's vengeance is much more fearful than earthly annihilation. And according to 1 Thessalonians 4, 6, God's vengeance is coming upon those who disregard the warning against lust. So I've learned again and again from first-hand experience that there are many professing Christians who have a view of salvation that disconnects it from real life and that nullifies the warnings of the Bible and puts the sinning person who claims to be a Christian beyond the reach of biblical threats. And this doctrine is comforting thousands on the way to hell. And this is where some of you are going to want to check out. Jesus said, if you don't fight lust, you won't go to heaven. The lust of the flesh can involve more than sex, kids. Money, greed, anger, guilt, all kinds of stuff. The stakes are much higher than whether the world is blown up by a thousand bombs. If you don't fight lust, you won't go to heaven. Look at Second Peter, excuse me, First Peter 2.11, Colossians 3.6, Galatians 5.21, 1 Corinthians 6.10, Hebrews 12.14. I'm just telling you, there's a lot of the Bible about it. Are we not then saved by faith, by believing in Jesus Christ? We are indeed. Those who persevere in faith shall be saved. How do you lay hold on eternal life? Paul gives the answer in 1 Timothy 6.12. Fight the good fight of faith, lay hold on eternal life. Notice, it's not just, oh, I got it. It says, he says, keep fighting the good fight of faith. There's something about continued action. There's continued obedience. There's continued behavior in, in the person who's all taking a hold of eternal life. That leads us to our main concern this morning to show that the, I'm back quoting Piper, sorry. To show that the fight against lust is a battle against unbelief. And the fight for sexual purity is the fight of faith. The great error that I'm trying to explode in these messages is the error that says faith in God is one thing and the fight for holiness is another. Faith gets you to heaven and holiness gets you rewards. You get your justification by faith and you get your sanctification by works. You start the Christian life in the power of the Spirit, you press on in the efforts of the flesh. This is the great evangelical error of our, our day. The battle for obedience is optional, they say, because only faith is necessary for salvation. 
Our response, the battle for obedience is absolutely necessary for salvation because it is the fight of faith. The battle against lust is absolutely necessary for salvation because it is the battle against unbelief. Faith alone delivers from hell, and the faith that delivers from hell delivers from lust. I hope you can see this is a greater gospel than the other one. It's the gospel of God's victory over sin, not just his tolerance of sin. It's the gospel of Romans 6.14. Sin will have no dominion over you since you are not under law, but under grace. Almighty grace. Sovereign grace. And then he quotes Galatians 6, 7, and 8. Do not be deceived. God cannot be mocked. A man reaps what he sows. Whoever sows to please their flesh from the flesh will reap destruction. Whoever sows to please the Spirit from the Spirit will reap eternal life. <laughs> if the way you believe, say, in your sex life has nothing to do with your basic relationship to God, then warnings of God's vengeance make no sense. It makes no sense when Paul says to Christians in Rome, if you live according to the flesh, you will die. That's Romans 8.13. It makes no sense when he says to the Corinthians, 1 Corinthians 10.9, we must not put the Lord to the test, as some of the Israelites did, and were destroyed by the serpents. It doesn't make sense when he says to the Galatian churches in Galatians 5.21, I warn you as I warned you before that those who do such things shall not enter the kingdom of God. And it doesn't make sense here in 1 Thessalonians 4, 6, when Paul says, let no man transgress and wrong his brother because God is an avenger in these things as we solemnly warned you. That is, it doesn't make sense unless your premise is wrong that the behavior of man has nothing to do with his salvation. And it surely is wrong for the tree is known by its fruit. John, 4, John 12 if anyone hears my words but does not keep them, I do not judge that person. For I did not come to judge the world, but to save the world. There is a judge for the one who rejects me and does not accept my words. What did Paul say? If you're rejecting me, if you're not doing what I'm saying, you're rejecting God. There is a judge for the one who rejects me and does not accept my words. The very words I have spoken will condemn them at the last day. John MacArthur writes about this. He says, the practice of sexual sin violates the work of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. It spurns the Lord's will, disregards His purposes, defies His commands, rejects His love, and flouts and abuses His grace. Perhaps most frightening and sobering of all, those who engage in sexual immorality discount the reality of God's righteous judgment against sin. Thus the Apostles Paul uh, exhortation to the Thessalonians ought to prompt all believers to faithfully heed these words and diligently use the means God has given them to abstain from all forms of sexual sin. Just a few passages to conclude with. Philippians 2.12 says, Therefore, my dear friends, as you have always obeyed, not only in my presence, but now much more in my absence, continue to work out your salvation with fear and trembling. Obedience is a part of salvation. If you're not obeying God, are you saved? Matthew 28, in the Great Commission, what did he say? He said, therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. And do what next? And teach them to obey everything I have commanded you. And surely I'm with you always to the very end of the age. Or here's Jesus one more time. And this would be a troubling one. Because what did Jesus say when he's met the people who say, oh, look at all these things we've done for you. Um, we've given them food and clothing and water, and, 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 but you never did it for me. And what does Jesus say? Then I will tell them plainly, I never knew you away from me, you evildoers. What's communion about? that imperfect, unholy people need to come back to him, need to confess sin, need to face up the fact that sometimes we're living rejecting God, that our very actions, our behaviors are going against him. Holy Spirit's dwelling within us and we're not obeying. And obedience is a part of salvation. So today I invite you to come. Grace is not cheap. It's free but it is not cheap. It cost God everything. And he continues to give 
so that we can be forgiven. So if you're not perfect, come to the table today. <laughs> if you are perfect, Lord help you. <laughs> if you're not perfect, come to the table today and receive what Jesus wants to give to you.